Father, let this be our cry today. Change our lives. Change, Lord, you've, you've changed us with the praise and worship. Lord, change us with the word. Let the water of the word wash us today so that we, Lord, will be refined. We will, we will be more like you. So today our prayer is, Father, change us, wash us, make us anew. Let all things pass away. And let, Lord, let the Word do something new in us today. Let it birth something totally new in us today. I know that we have problems and we have situations. But, Lord, Your Word can change all that, Father. Lord, sometimes you don't want to change the situation, but you want to change us. So I'm asking that You would change us today by Your Word. Let the Holy Spirit fall in a great way as it did in Acts, O oh Father. It says in Acts that, that when Peter was preaching the word, when the Holy Spirit fell upon people, people began to pray in tongues and magnify the Lord. So I thank you that that's going to happen today as we look to you for change. Amen. Good morning. For this morning's scripture, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Luke chapter 9. And I, I mentioned this morning, if you ever get on other churches' websites, and a lot of times they have the pastor's sermons on there, you go down and look through and you, you find out that a lot of pastors don't preach every week at their own church. They have guest speakers all the time. And uh, we have very few guest speakers here, and it's not because I'm trying to hog the pulpit. I just don't want to miss anything. Uh, but one of the dangers with that, and I, I, I thought about that, why some of these guys earn your paycheck, you know? But I thought to myself, maybe they're smarter than I am, because sometimes when you hear the same person, Paul, do we have some lights on there? Or anybody's in the dark. When they get the Bible so they can read it. There, that's better, and I... There you are. I thought I was talking to an empty room. But sometimes you get so tuned in with the pastor's voice, no matter how good he is. And let me tell you, I preach some good stuff. I'm, ju I'm just saying. No. But we can get, I'm only joking. Uh, we can get, no, I'm not. I get some good stuff. But we can get so tuned in to the pastor's voice that you, you don't listen to what he's saying. And so you get, we get somebody else that comes in, a guest who says the same thing. And it's wonderful. And I've had people come up to me, wow, wasn't that great? And I'm looking at them, I say, like I say that every week, dude. You know. But we get so tuned into the pastors. So this morning, I don't want you to get tuned in. I'm gonna change my voice. So that you don't get tuned in. So would you please pay attention this morning? Luke chapter nine, I want to begin reading at verse fifty-seven. And Cindy, that was, Cindy, she's not out here, but that, that song just went right along with what I'm preaching on today. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And he said to another, follow me, but he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to them, allow the dead or the spiritually dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Another also said, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, no one after putting his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Lord, I, I'm praying that a new voice would be heard today. It wouldn't be the voice of this preacher whose throat and voice is wearing out, but it would be the voice of the Holy Spirit that would speak loud and clear into every person, into every situation we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today after this service, as you know, we're going to be gathering at Arrowhead Lake to witness and to celebrate the baptism of some people who are publicly declaring that they are following Jesus. And that's what baptism is. It's a public declaration. Like a wedding ring is a public declaration of the wedding vows. And baptism is not so much a ceremony as it is as is 
as, as much as it is a testimony. A testimony that states, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. That is the testimony of baptism. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And there are many today that want to get baptized, but you know, you, you get surrendered under the water, but they want to hold something out of the water. They don't want to surrender everything. They want to hold something up as they go under the water. They want to hold something up. Maybe it's a, a relationship, maybe it's a habit, but Lord, you can have it all, but not this. And so they hold something out of the water. They don't want everything to be buried with the Lord in baptism. They want to keep something that they desire alive. And I've witnessed a troubling trend in the church today. Because it seems like the churches are so desperate to get people in that anything goes just to get them in. And sometimes the impression is given in their desire not to offend people or in their desire not to lose people that God will love you and accept anything. I want to clarify that this morning. That's not true. God accepts anyone, but He doesn't accept anything. I've gotten so many people upset with me. And let me tell you something. I'm a good person. And I'm not just joking. I'm, I'm a good person. I, you know, I love people. I'm a good person. But I've gotten so many people mad at me over the years that have left the church. Why? Because I wouldn't marry them. Because I wouldn't baptize them. Why? Because they're living with somebody or sleeping with somebody. And, or they can't be allowed to minister. I've, I've had to ask people to step off the worship team, off the teaching. Why? Because something in their lifestyle. And I get the blame for it. I'm the bad guy and they get mad at me. I told my wife that at this time in our ministry, we, we could have had 800 to 1,000 people already in this church if I compromised and said anything goes. See, Jesus desires that all men come to him, but he's not desperate to accept anything. Some churches might be today, but he's not. Why? Jesus has a screening process. They're screened through the blood. And the church today is full of people who say they have come through the blood, who say they have come to Christ, but they've never repented. They've never turned from their sin, and they're still in it. In order to take the road of following Jesus, you cannot continue to walk down another road. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be perfect. Your life doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have everything together to be a Christian or to be a part of this church. But there must be a screening process. You must be screened through the blood by repentance. Now listen to this, because I, I really feel the Lord gave me this, and I don't say that too often. Lord gives, you know, you seek the Lord for sermons, but every now and then he drops just a golden nugget. And I, I think the Lord gave me this. To get people in the door, it seems that the church is trying to make God seem just in our eyes. We try to make God seem just in our eyes, to the point where he has to accept anything and everything. God is just in our eyes. So we can live together. Homosexual involvement. Drinking. Whatever it might be. He understands. He loves us. He's just. And he's a loving God. And so we try to make him just in our eyes. Instead of making us just in his eyes. And there's only one way that we can make us just in His eyes. It's through the blood of Jesus Christ and repentance. And baptism is a testimony of that. I believe that there's been a failure in the church. We get lots of people who come to the altar. Churches everywhere. But I think there's been a failure of the church. Failure to tell people 
that the old life must end in order to have a new life in Christ. Could somebody say amen to that? Second Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, it doesn't tell you that you have to be in Christ, but if you profess to be in Christ, he is a new creature. He's a new creation. What does that mean? The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. New things can't come when we're still hanging on to the old things. Oh, this is a message for somebody today. The evidence of the new birth is not the smile on your face. The evidence of the new birth is not your attendance in church. The evidence of the new birth is a new life in us. I'm not the same person I used to be. Thank God. I was telling in the new believers, God, I can have a carnal snap now and then. <laughs> There seems to have been in the church a readjusting of its standards over the years to accommodate the declining standards of society. So instead of readjusting society, society has readjusted the church. He's like the grandfather God, you know, kind and warm and smiling. He never gets angry. And in his eyes, we can never do anything wrong. He just loves us. We want to come to Jesus without forsaking sin. That's not the gospel. Many have made a decision to meet Jesus without having made a commit commitment to follow him. All the time we get people at the altar who come, yeah, they want to meet Jesus, but that's as far as it goes. There's no commitment to following him. Following him takes commitment. He wants us to follow him headlong with our whole heart. But we follow him backwards. And so my title this morning is Following Jesus But First. <laughs> See, I know what you're thinking. It is a play on words. Because if we follow Jesus but first, we're facing the wrong direction. But in these six verses in Luke, Jesus spells out the depth of commitment that he expects of those who say they're followers of Jesus. People get it confused, and I'm the one who says these, or the church is the one who says these. And so we get the, we get the brunt of everybody's anger. But I'm not the one who said it. It's Jesus who gave the requirement of repentance. On his way to Jerusalem in this story, he, he's approached by three potential disciples. And what is odd and what is striking is the response that he gives to each of them. I mean, we're, somebody comes up and says, man, I'd like to join your church. What can we do, man? Come. But the response that he gives them is kind of striking. His reply, instead of drawing them in, it tends to drive them away. As a matter of fact, he seems to turn away more people, more would-be disciples than he takes in. Why? Because he has a screening process. And I want to make it clear that the gospel of Jesus Christ is inclusive to anyone, but at the same time, it's exclusive to anything. So today I want to look at these Three potential Christians, three potential church members, three potential baptism, baptism candidates who all wanted to follow Jesus, it seems, but first. The first one. First man says, I'll follow you wherever, but first. But first, let me see what it has to offer me. I'll follow you wherever, but first. Verse 57, as they were going along the road, someone said to them, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to them, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The man says, Lord, I, I, I just love you, man. I'm going to follow you wherever. And it sounded so good. 
He knew the exact right words to say. And he states his commitment in a sentence. Or, or perhaps he, he sings his, sang it in a song. Where he leads me, I will follow. Wherever, Lord, you name it. No restrictions, no boundaries, no borders. Wherever, I will follow you. Oh, it sounded so impressive. It sounded so spiritual. But let me tell you something. Everything that sounds spiritual isn't always spiritual. In the excitement of the moment, in the emotion of a song perhaps, we can lift up our hands. We can have tears coming down our face. We can look and sound spiritual. Wherever you go, Lord, I'm going with you. I surrender all. It's easy to do that in the congregation. Oh, that's little new Leona. Just like three days old. It's easy to surrender to the Lord in the congregation of the people. It's easy to do it in the excitement of the praise. It's easy to do it in the solemnness of the worship. And people do it each and every week in each and every church. They're sincere. I have no doubt about it for the moment. Jesus is not so much interested in our attendance as he is our commitment. Kyle Eidelman writes in his book, Not a Fan. Listen to this. Every week, all the fans of Jesus come to cheer for him, but they have no interest in truly following him. But in the moment, and for the moment, oh, we want wherever you go, Lord. And the man was saying, wherever you take me, Lord, I'm with you. Wherever you go, Lord, I'll go. Now look at his response. Jesus didn't say, well, bless you, my brother, come. Listen to what he says. He says, the foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. In other words, Jesus is saying, oh, that's nice that you want to follow me. That's nice that you're going to go wherever I go. It's nice that you made that declaration here in the comfortable sanctuary by surrounded by other people who also want to go with. That's really nice. But do you really understand what it's going to cost you? I mean, if you have this picture of having notoriety and, and getting royal treatment, somebody gave you the wrong information. Can you see the dumbfounded look on his eyes? What? Jesus says, man, I'm homeless. You want to follow me? I'm homeless. I don't have a steady paycheck. And by follow me, it's not going to be very popular to follow me. Have you really thought this thing through? He said, have you counted the cost? And the man said, wait, 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 wait a minute, Lord. Did you say homeless? You mean there's not going to be any comforts? Not going to be, there's no riches, there's no fame involved in this? About that wherever stuff, Lord, let me just back up a minute I know I said I'll follow you wherever, but let me just reconsider as I look what it, what it offers me. See, he wanted to follow Jesus, but first. The idea of being homeless was outside of this man's understanding of the gospel of Jesus. It was outside his comfort zone. It, it conflicted with his spirit. I'll tell you, have you ever seen somebody, when, when the word is going out, it conflicts with their spirit? Why? Because it conflicts with their comfort zone. There's a war going on inside. And that's what was going on. He says, man, I, I thought this was going to be a journey of excitement and comfort. I didn't know it was going to be a, a journey of risk and uncertainty. So he gives up following Jesus because of the uncertainty of it. I said last week there's, there's not room for faith if you're full of fear, and there's no room for fear if you're full of faith. Now listen to this. We sang about it, blessed be your name in the desert and with sunshine and all that, because that's faith. Faith, Lord, I'm holding on. I'm holding on no matter what. Because faith says, 
Whatever comes, I'm holding on. Fear says, what if it comes? I won't be able to, because what if? So instead of being joyful for all that he would have gained following Jesus, he was afraid of all that he would lose. And there's a lot of people afraid of, they're looking at things that they're going to have to lose in their life to follow Jesus. But Jim Elliott was a missionary who was killed for what God wanted him to do. He had this saying, he says, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Love that. Amen. The rich young man in Matthew 19 is faced with a similar decision to follow Jesus or keep his comfort. Keep his stuff. Keep his relationship, whatever it was. And Luke 9.23 says, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. See, we want to say, say, we want to say yes to Jesus. We want to follow Jesus, but we don't want to say no to ourselves. Yes to Jesus without saying no to ourselves is really saying no to Jesus and yes to ourselves. So Jesus' idea of following him is way different than our... We, we have all these rationalized things. Uh, this is what it means to follow Jesus. I can do this, I can do that, I can do that. But his idea is totally different. It actually threatens the man's comfort. And comfort can be a commitment killer. Why? Because comfort drains passion. You know how I know? I've seen it. Have you ever seen a brand new Christian who genuinely gets saved? And, and I mean, they are just full of fire. And, uh, you know, my wife always says, some new Christians you have to lock up for a while. I mean, they're just, they're just want to turn the world inside out. But older Christians who have been saved for any length of time sit in their comfort zone. And what happens? The passion drains out of them. The fire turns into a flicker over time. It's not supposed to be comfortable to be a Christian. And sometimes it's not going to be, you're going to be uncomfortable. Some of you are going to be uncomfortable being a Christian in your own home. You're going to be comfortable at work. You're going to be uncomfortable at school. Wherever, Lord. And the Lord says, well, how about in your home? Let's start there. Wherever, Lord. How about at work? How about in school? It says, wait a minute, let me reconsider. You, you're telling me that I have to be a Christian there too? I thought like I could punch a clock in on Sunday morning and that was good enough. I'm good to go. I'm here. I'm a Christian. I came. Maybe a special meeting once in a while. But I have to do it on my job? Wherever. Until Jesus says, how about there? Well, you know, Lord, I said I would follow you wherever, but not there ever. <laughs> wherever, Lord, on Sunday, but not there on Monday. Somebody said that being a Christian is free, but it will cost you everything. I don't believe that you can be a casual Christian. Casual Christian is a Christian in name only. Because being a casual Christian costs nothing. But a true follower comes with sacrifice and a price tag. I said this morning, it's like the bacon and egg breakfast. You know, the chicken and the, and the pig get together and say, we're going to provide breakfast. And the chicken makes a contribution to breakfast where the pig gave it all. And there's a lot of hens when it comes to Christianity. We want to make a little controversy. Well, I came Sunday. I'm good. But the pig says, I surrender all. He was saying what a lot of people in church say today. I will follow you, Lord, wherever you go. As long as it doesn't require any significant changes. I will follow you, Lord, and I don't mind coming to church at all as long as it doesn't interfere with my life. 
I will follow you, Lord. I, I'm willing to go wherever you want as long as it doesn't interrupt my routine. Jesus will never erupt in your life if he doesn't first disrupt and interrupt your life. So the man wanted to be accepted by Jesus without making a commitment. I want to put that in easy terms that you can follow. It's like the man and the woman dating and things start to get a little bit serious, you know, and they're dating and she, she wants to get married. I don't know why I said she. Why is it always the woman who wants to get married? I, I don't know, but she wanted to get married and uh, he, he loves her and he doesn't want to lose her, but, but he doesn't want to get married because he fears the commitment and it's going to require too much of him. And so he convinces the woman to move in together. And a lot of people want to move in with Jesus. They don't want the commitment when it comes to Jesus. They just want to shack up for the benefits, but pack up for the commitment. It's like the crowd that followed him. He had thousands that followed him when he was handing out the fish and the loaves. But they all left when it was time to make a commitment. So this man says, wherever, Lord, but first. The second man says, I will follow whenever, but first. Whenever, whenever you want, Lord. Until, but first wait till a better time. Verse 59, he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. Now that sounds like a good thing. That sounds like a legitimate request until you realize that most Bible scholars agree that the man's father wasn't dead yet. I mean, if your father just died, would you be out socializing somewhere? Hey, how you doing? Good, my dad died today, but I thought I'd come here. No, so most Bible scholars believe that his father wasn't even dead yet and that he wouldn't be dead for a long time. He says, I will follow you, what he was saying, I, was, I will follow whenever you want, but first, let's wait till my parents die. That's what he was saying. Maybe he was afraid of what his parents would think if he committed totally to Jesus. And I've shared this before, but I had, a, I had an uncle that told me once, you know, a little bit of religion is okay, but just don't get carried away. A little bit is okay. It's okay to go to church on Sunday. Well, he's saved today, by the way. And maybe some of you are afraid to make a commitment to Jesus because of family or because of friends or like the first person because of what it might require of you. You might lose something. I'll follow you, Lord, whenever you want, but first, let's wait till they die. I'll follow you, Lord, whenever you want, but first, let's wait till it's a little bit more convenient. I'll follow you, Lord, whatever you want, but first, let's wait till I graduate from college. I'll follow you, Lord, whenever you want, but first, let me get married. Let me have some children. Let me have some grandchildren. But, but whenever you want, Lord. When, let me sow some wild oats first. I'll follow you whenever, but first, not now. Have you ever had someone in your life that tells you, hey, whenever you need me, just call. Yeah, I'll be there. Whenever you need me, call. And so every time you call, you get, man, I would, but I can't now. It makes the whenever sound a whole lot like can never. And I coined this word today. I'm going to start calling them can neverous people. <laughs> I mean, you look at this, what a difference between the disciples when Jesus called the disciples. You remember the story when Peter and Andrew were, were uh, working on their nets and everything. Jesus tells them, he says, follow me. They were, they were out there working on their nets, just come back from fishing. Follow me. They didn't say, I'll follow you, Lord, whenever you want. But first, let me get a good catch of fish. I'll follow you, Lord, whenever you want. But first, wait till I get a better job. This, I, I need a bigger boat, whatever it is. No, it says, immediately. They left their nets and followed him. 
And then he calls to the next two, James and John, their brothers, and they're in their boat with their father. And he calls them, and they didn't say, oh, yes, Lord, we'll follow you whenever you want, but first let me take care of my father. Let me make sure the business is in good hand. No, it says that immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. You see, Jesus is looking for those who will come now. He's looking for those who will obey now. Because he's got all kinds of people who will obey tomorrow. He's got all kinds of people who are willing to come tomorrow. And now notice he doesn't respond like we might in the church. He doesn't say, hey, I understand your situation that you're in. I know it's not convenient now. And I, I, I don't want to bring any pressure or anxiety into your life. So you just take your time and it, everything's good. You come. No, he said, no buts first. No but first. So when are you going to make a serious commitment to Jesus? How about tomorrow? Let's do it tomorrow. Well, technically, if that's you and you've been putting it off till tomorrow, today is the tomorrow that you put it off till yesterday. You know why? Because now is never, never a good time. Now you're in a dilemma there because now is never a good time and there's not a tomorrow on God's calendar. I want to, Lord, but not now. God says, I'm sorry, that's all I have is now. I will obey, Lord, just not now. Sorry, that's all I have is now. Let me just get things cleaned up in my life. Let me get, let me get the family situation straightened out. Let me get their relationship on the right track. See, it's a matter of priority. Now, I want you to catch this. The thing that you have the hardest time surrendering has the greatest potential of replacing Jesus as your top priority. The thing that you have the hardest time surrendering, the thing that you argue with God about surrendering, the thing that you fight with God about surrendering has the greatest potential of replacing Jesus as your top priority. Now there's nothing wrong with families. You ought to love your families and I hope you do. But Jesus says of that in Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter or any other relationship more than me is not worthy of me. So Jesus has called us to a new path. Those of you who are getting baptized, you're called to a new path and you can't walk down a new path if you're still on the old one. Whenever... Until Jesus says, now. Whenever, Lord, I'll follow you. But first. Lastly, I will give you whatever. Wherever, whenever, whatever. I will give you whatever, but first. Let me hang on to something. Let me hold it out of the water so it doesn't get wet. I'll give you whatever you want, but just let me hang on to this. Verse 61 says, another says, I will follow you, Lord, but first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. See, he wanted to follow Jesus, but Jesus wasn't his priority. There were other things that were more important. There were other things that he wanted to do more than follow Jesus. And he wasn't just talking about a quick goodbye hug. I mean, when you say goodbye to somebody, you're leaving on a trip, you're leaving. It, it, he's talking about an extended, long farewell party. And in that long farewell party with the old crowd, I mean, the relatives and the friends would try to talk them out of going into this commitment. And it also seems that Jesus detected an attitude in him. You know what? Jesus knows our attitudes. It, he detected an attitude that this man wanted to follow him but he wanted to stay connected to the old life. You remember Elisha in the Old Testament, when he followed, when he went to follow the Lord, what happened? He burned his plow and slaughtered his oxen. But we don't want to do that. We want to follow the Lord, but still hang on to all the stuff. Still hang on to the relationships, still hang on to the habits, still hang on to the old crowd, the old places, and the old hangout. 
So he says, I'll follow you wherever you want me to. I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. But first, let me spend some time with the old crowd. I'd, I'd love to follow you, Lord, as long as I can still hang on to this from the past. I'm willing to follow, but I'm unwilling to let go of something. You ready for this? He says, I will give you whatever you want, Lord, as long as I can hang on to whatever I want. I hope you're not getting tuned into my voice, because this is good stuff. As, as long as I don't have to give up that relationship, Lord, I, whatever you want. Hold that out of the water. As long as I don't have to quit going here or quit going there, I'll follow you. I'll hang, hold that out of the water. As long as it doesn't get involved getting involved. As long as I don't have to give money. Whatever you want, Lord, as long as it doesn't require money. Whatever you want, Lord, as long as it doesn't require time. So when he says, I'll give you whatever, what he really meant was whatever is left over. Whatever I don't really need, I'll give you, Lord. Whatever I can spare, I'll give you, Lord. I'll follow you with whatever I have as long as I don't have to do anything with what I have. As long as I can come once a week. Are you good with that, Lord? I don't have to change anything at home. I don't have to change anything. As long as I can walk through the door, sing a few songs, and, and force myself to listen to that guy. Is that good enough? Am I in the door? But the Lord says, wait a minute. Weren't you the one who had your hands lifted up singing just a moment ago? Weren't you the one who was saying, all that I have, Lord, is yours. All that I am, Lord, is yours. You said whatever, didn't you? Yeah. But I really didn't mean that. I know I said whatever, Lord, but I really didn't mean this. You see, I was speaking in general. I wasn't speaking in specific things, whatever, you know, general. We always say whatever until the Lord says, how about this? And then we say whatever. Saying yes to Jesus involves saying no to some things or some people that are in our lives. Whatever. How about the relationship? How about your time? How about your money? How about your talents? I, you know, I love the songs that we sing, and I, and I watch you sing them, and I know what my heart is like when I sing them. But the Lord filters our words. So we're up there singing, eyes closed. Ah, and a little sway to it. I surrender all. I surrender all. Now, by the time it's filtered to the Lord, through our heart, this is what he hears. I surrender some. Oh, I surrender some. That's how the Lord hears it. Christy saying this morning, in the light of who you are, in the light of what you've done, I surrender a fragment. <laughs> Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering part. <laughs> Surrendering heart. See, one was rejected for thinking more about himself than following Jesus. The second one was concerned with other obligations, and the third one was more concerned with other priorities. All of them wanted to follow Jesus, but first. And when you follow, like I said, when you follow Jesus, but first, you're facing the wrong direction. What about you? Are you putting your butt first? If 
following Jesus. Could you bow your heads just for a moment? Jesus is calling you head first to him. It's not an easy thing. It's not a magical thing. You come up here and say some words. It's free, but it will cost you. It's repentance, turning from something and turning to Jesus. If you don't know Christ today as your Savior, I want to put out this appeal to you. Are you ready to come to Jesus? Not just to meet Him, but make a commitment to Him. Is there anyone here today who says, I would like to come to Jesus today? Oh, He has lots to offer. It's going to cost you something, but He has more to offer. Maybe there's some here today that says, Lord, I will follow you wherever. And he's saying to you, okay, how about there? And even as they say the word there, already in your mind, you already know what it is. I'll follow you wherever, Lord. How about there? Lord, I will, I will follow you whenever. And he's saying, how about now? Lord, I will give you whatever. And he was saying, what about this thing? What about that thing? So just in the quietness of your heart, maybe you've been guilty of singing, I surrender all, but the Lord knows it means some. And take that time right now and say, Lord, that has been me, but I'm going to surrender it all. So, Father, I pray that you would take this message today. It's not an easy believism. No matter what other churches might teach or preach, your word is clear. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be saved. It's not continue. It's go and sin no more. So, Lord, I pray that you would raise up in this place not people who have met you, but people committed to follow you, not butt first, but head first. You be in the head. Well, so today we're going to witness some of those who have decided to follow Jesus and the words of Jesus, repent and be baptized. So let's assemble up at Arrowhead Lake. And come with a song in your heart as we rejoice, not just a ceremony, but a testimony. God bless you.